Okay, well. for joining us today. My name is Susan Jama. I am the programs and the community coordinator here at Onsite Gallery. We are so excited to have you all join us here uh, on the Reviving Lost, uh, sorry, Reviving Lost Histories in Indigenous and Black and African Communities. Um, I would like to start off with the uh, land acknowledgement. Susan Jama. So, on-site gallery and OCAD University acknowledges the ancestral territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishbek, and the Huron Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of the land on which we live, work, and create. As a person of African origins and as an immigrant, I offer this land acknowledgement in recognition, in solidarity with the Indigenous peoples of Toronto Island. Sorry. Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions towards decolonization. I also want to acknowledge and express deep gratitude towards the land of Turtle Island in which my family and I reside, work and create here. I am also grateful for our communities and to share the space with you all and with all the beings that live on and within this land. On-site gallery is OCAD University's professional gallery and experimental curatorial platform for art, design, and digital media. Serving the OCAD U community and the general public, on-site gallery aims to foster social and cultural transformations. I would also like to, and we would also like to acknowledge the support Canada Council for the Arts for the Digital Now grant. We would like to thank our Jordan Bennett Times to Souvenir and Pidawaki. We go upriver supporters. City of Toronto through Artworks TO. Our lead exhibition sponsor, KPMB Architects, City of Toronto, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, TD Canada, Nexus, IOTA, the Delaney Family Foundation, with the additional support from Bill Munroney and Nancy McCain Foundation and Partners in Art. Today, we have fantastic five panelists who are joining us today. Um, and I will shortly introduce them all to you. I would also like to give a brief description what this panel is about. Reviving lost histories in indigenous and black and African communities. This panel, it coincides with Souvenir. It is a solo exhibition, which is on until Saturday, December the 10th. So till next Saturday. And Peter Waki, we go upriver, the large scale outdoor mural on the south wall of 100 McCall Street. Both sites are specific and where 
created by Jordan Bennett. <clears throat> and Jordan Bennett has joined us today. So I would like to introduce Jordan. Jordan is a Mi'kmaq visual artist from Stephenville Crossing, Newfoundland, and lives and works on his ancestral territory of Mi'kmaqi, Corner Brook, Newfoundland. Jordan ongoing practice utilizes painting, sculpture, textiles, video installation, public art, and sound to explore land, language, the act of visiting familiar histories and challenging colonial perception. Focus on exploring Mi'kmaq and biotech visual culture. In the past 10 years, Jordan has participated in over 90 group and soul exhibitions nationally and internationally as well as created numerous public art commissions. Bennett is currently working towards several public arts works nationally, as well as group and solo exhibitions. So this is Jordan Bennett. Jordan Bennett, he will take away with his brief presentation. Thank you, Susan. Sorry for this far from to pass here. Uh, thank you, everyone, and I appreciate uh, um, being part of this amazing group of uh, creatives and, uh, and, and members of the communities. Um, so yeah, my name is Jordan Bennett. I'm a Mi'kmaq artist uh, from the Hamkuk. And um, uh, it was an honor to work on um, uh, here in Toronto um, at Onsite and through OCAD for both the exhibition and the, the mural. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the mural that I recently completed here at OCAD in June, um, Bidawa Dieg, which means we go up river. Um, and uh, it's, um, I was invited to create this mural um, by uh, OCAD University, Lisa uh, Deanne Smith um, cur uh, curated this piece. And um, I wanted to speak about um, my place as a visitor to this territory um, and uh, um, through um, conversation and collaboration with uh, the Indigenous community here uh, at OCAD University, um, came up with this piece based on um, some porcupine co-work that uh, resides here in the Toronto area at the Royal Ontario Museum, which you can see at the exhibition here um, at OCAD, um, part of Souvenir. Uh, this piece itself um, speaks about the underground riverways the history of this place, and I'm excited to be um, right up alongside and part of the uh, the park, Butterfield Park, um, and uh, uh, being part of one of the only outward facing um, Indigenous representations at OCAD University's um, campus like this. So thank you to Lisa and Ryan for that. Uh, next image, please. Um, a lot of my work, um, this, well, this is the piece that uh, is, it ha helped um, shape and inspire the core of the, um, the mural along with the exhibition here. So this is a piece of Mi'kmaq porcupine core work from my territory. Um, this piece dates back to um, the late 1800s and it's a chair seat cover. Um, so this, if you look closely, these are all individual porcupine quills uh, to create this beautiful uh, tapestry of um, color and shape and story all inserted into birch bark. So this is one of the community belongings that I um, um, often refer back to when creating and trying to um, tell new stories about who we are as Mi'kmaq people today in our different territories that we live on and reside. Next image. Um, here it is as it exists currently in this moment. I'm actually honored to be right across the hall from Susan right now um, and uh, in this space. So this piece has been um, visiting with its, its other community members, uh, uh, human and non-human, um, uh, in this space for the last few months. And uh, it's in conversation with other porcupine full work pieces from my home territory uh, in this space. So if you get a chance, come down and check it out. And if you've already come to check out the show, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the show. Um, next image. Uh, his, this is another piece. Um, uh, in the show uh, with Porcupine Full Work. So I get the, the chance to work with uh, and collaborate with these pieces uh, in conversation with uh, different institutions that uh, have them in their collections. Um, and a lot of them haven't seen the light or visited with other people or, or uh, community belongings in hundreds of years. So this piece, um, I had a chance to 
work with uh, and continue a story over what I intergenerational, I would call it the conversation over a space and time. Um, this piece being over 150 years old and my interpretation uh, and continuation of the story. And then the stories that come from the conversations between the pieces in the gallery itself. Um, so next image. Here's a, a long shot of each of the pieces speaking to one another. Um, so it, uh, in the presentation of this work, I, I tried to break the barriers of uh, uh, what and how uh, museums have uh, presented our community belongings on all our communities. Um, uh, I speak about, you know, Indigenous, non-Indigenous folks who have been colonized um, and uh, how it's often kept behind glass in museum cases. So these are open on the side so they can breathe and talk to one another, which is an important part of the teachings I received and um, about um, sharing with one another, visiting with one another. Next. Another shot. Uh, yeah, you can just keep scrolling through a couple of these. So I utilize color in a lot of my pieces um, to speak about connection to land, territory, and uh, other worldly beings um, and uh, connections to one another. Um, so utilizing community community belongings, but also uh, things that I have harvested from my home as well. So these are some moves from my territory that I had a chance to honor with uh, some painting. Um, I do large scale murals as well. I just finished another one. This is a piece in Nova Scotia and Halifax in Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, to speak about uh, place and territory and, and, and belonging. Uh, you can just scroll through these as well. Uh, this is a aerial view, but this is some of the shots, of very bright, colorful piece. So um, yeah, this one rivals styes uh, with OCADs. So uh, it's been an honor to create some more bright and beautiful pieces um, to allow people an entry point into um, my artwork, but also our, our communities. Um, culture and our, our, our forms and our art forms. Um, I also do a lot of installation work. So this is a show that was at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery at the same time as this current show where I use um, um, different types of media. So reflective road signs, as well as uh, laser cut um, pieces. This piece was to honor uh, Mi'kmaq artist, Michael McDonald. Um, so each butterfly representing each year of his life there's 65 butterflies that hang to honor uh, his piece called butterfly garden so uh, i wanted to um, talk about territory and you know show some new pieces that i'm working on as well so yeah keeping it bright keeping it um, um telling stories that uh speak about our resilience and strength as uh, Mi'kmaq and indigenous people so Thank you very much for listening and I'll pass it on to the next uh, person. Olalan. Thank you, Jordan. Honestly, that butterfly uh, garden, it looks fantastic. It Thank really you. does. Yeah, no worries. I wish I could visit uh, maybe in the next exhibition that it comes up. Yeah, it's currently on at uh, in Ottawa right now, so. Okay. All right, I'll try my best to go there. <laughs> so next up is uh, Camille Hardy. He is joining us from USA, uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis. Um, and he is a visual artist, an art organizer, graphic designer, and an archivist whose work examines the relationship between objects and shared meanings and heritage in contemporary Somali art with an emphasis in memory. He draws reference from diverse cultural, archival, and oral traditions. Kamil is a co-founder and co-director of Somal House of, House of Art, an artist-run organization and collective base in Minneapolis. He has a master's degree in heritage studies and public history and Bachelor of Fine Arts in graphic design from College of Design, University of Minnesota. So Kamil. The floor is yours. Sorry, Camel. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, I have, um, want to, to express my sincere gratitude, first and foremost, for inviting me to this panel. And I also want to thank um, uh, and congratulate Jordan Bennett on his current exhibit at on site and for including us towards the programming of this exhibit. Uh, it's unfortunate that I will not be able to see it in person. Um, however, I am um, 
uh, happy to see the images you just provided. I have a few slides I want to share with you to situate my work and practice with regards to the uh, title of our discussion. You can go to the next slide, please. This um, slide that you're seeing is a collage of images from my recent project, Kana Hasuso, Kana Hus, Orality, Visuality, and the Colonial Archive of Somalia uh, from 1885 till 1960. Uh, in this project, together with my fellow artist, Wasima Farah, who is pictured here with me at the bottom right image, uh, we research anti colonial oral poetry and songs and subsequently illustrated visuals out of these art forms so they can be in conversation uh, with the mass colonial iconographies produced during this period. Uh, all of this to, to really reimagine, reinterpret, and restitute the visuality of this period through the lens of the Somalis. So in that sense, my work is, is rather a, a mesh of reintroducing, uh, reinvestigating, and also reviving of either lost, unknown, or sometimes completely rediscovering of the history of Somali visual art, uh, visual representation, um, orality, and archives. This, this labyrinth is partly due to the diasporic nature of the Somali community in Minnesota and the historical complexity of Somalia before, during, and in the aftermath of colonization of unlimited rules, sometimes short, sometimes long durations, uh, unrest, mass, mass, mass migration, globalization, and neocolonialism, and so on. I list all of these historical and current systems of power and its effects to, to registering the complexity of when we say reviving lost histories. It is more of, of uh, discovering and reinvestigating this enmeshed history of my community. And I say this because I am in what uh, Stuart Hall called it a historical conjuncture. In other words, my thoughts, questions, geographical location, gaps in the history books, and so on in this very specific time is different than that of the previous generation and will be the one after this. So therefore the, the tension or the obesity with which my generation has to work with is that of historicity and how history is being preserved and documented. I am uh, thinking broadly along the lines of, of archiving, uh, the use of visual arts to share stories and histories the existing wide literature gap in detailing the complexity of our history and the silences it has created and buried, the continuity of our language and either the upkeep or the development of new tools or, or ways which we can use to aid the oral tradition. Now, the good thing about orality is that it would last far longer than the text, but the bad thing about memorization or continuing the passing down of this tradition, then that history is also gone. We are in an age that our ancestors did not have to deal with. And this is what I meant by the historical conjuncture. Quote, we are in an era with mass uh, proliferation of image consumption, increase of the written text and the advent of new forms of technologies that the current and upcoming generations use to communicate with one another. To bring all of this home, it is through this lens and the Somali diasporic community in Minnesota that I come from. And I use the arts to share our history, highlight the culture, confront the contradictions, contradictions and provide avenues of new imaginations, retrievals and historical production. Uh, next image, please. This is uh, a project uh, called Of Rituals and Road, and it consists of two video installations and a sculptural piece. Uh, in the first video, I have used my mother's childhood songs to reimagine her and her friend grinding maize uh, in the early 50s with her actual vocals as a background sound. In the second video, I presented the, uh, the rituals of getting ready for prayer in the Islamic tradition and the sculptural piece uh, of the Somali stool, Gumber, which is nested in, in three sizes. So basically the running motif of these artworks were repetitions and rituals such as praying, working, sitting, sleeping, basically the daily repetitions of our life. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, this project, so but but or come jump jump, it's it's is a calling for dance and which isolates traditional Somali dance movements, uh, the head, uh, the trunk, and 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 the limbs. Again, isolating repeat, uh, repeated movements and the transformation uh, and the transformation and and transcendence the the body assumes during dance rituals. Next slide, please. Uh, this project is the stamps of Somalia, um, illuminating a nation in which I wanted to reimagine what the post stamps of Somalia would be like if the postal department was in place. Uh, basically, um, one of the things about, you know, uh, things that I do beyond just being a visual artist is also I'm a graphic designer, and I also think about uh, the, the Somali design aesthetics as well, and it's something that I've been long been interested in researching uh, um, about it. Next slide, please. And so in 2014, I, I helped co-found this artist collective and contemporary art gallery based in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota uh, with fellow artists Khadija Musa and Mahmoud Mu'min. Through Somal House of Art, we've been able to connect Somali artists in the state of Minnesota, the nation and globally as well to, to understand the hyphenated identities uh, across um, boundaries. But all of us are, are striving to, to continue the conversations that were started before we entered this world. And, and our mission through Soma House of Art and, and my personal mission is that through the arts, we can reflect and, and practice in tandem to broaden the discourse of Somali culture and its art. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Camel. Um... I had the opportunity to uh, visit you twice in Minnesota and both times I honestly was really was excited and super happy about the fact that you and the other co-founders are like providing a space for Somali performing artists as well as visual artists. Um, I'm, a Somali, I'm Somali as well. Um, so for me, it's also like um, being part of that representation, even though you live in the States and I live in Canada, there's not that many of us in this field. So big up, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. So next up is Kyle Sav. He is a Rama First Nations uh, band member artist who primarily works with quilts and birch park. Uh, Kyle began experimenting with porcupine uh, quilts in March, 2020 during the initial stages of the pandemic. Without access to traditional teachers, he struggled to gather information about this art form. Following a few months of trial and error, Kyle began to grasp the fundamental principles of quilt work. Eventually, Kyle was able to connect with a number of talented indigenous artists by establishing an online presence through various social media platforms, most notably Bar Tushik uh, King of uh, Sweetgrass and Cinnamon, who assisted him in expanding into various traditional mediums, such as caribou hair tuffling and see, uh, sorry, sweetgrass. And I also had the opportunity to actually meet Kyle in person as he did come to OCAD um, and hosted a workshop on uh, porcupine quills. Um, and he was able to teach 15 OCAD students um, about that artwork. I will pass the floor off to Kyle. Miigwech, Susan. Uh, first of all, I just want to say how grateful I am to be here today amongst uh, my fellow artists. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new into this field. And as Susan mentioned, it's been about three years since I've started this journey. And um, it's been a really exciting one. So we'll go on to the presentation. We'll do the next slide, please. So um, Anine Bojo, my name is Kyle Sovin. Um, we'll go ahead and do the next slide as well. Um, I'm an Anishinaabe visual artist who specializes in porcupine quill work. Um, part of it is me using traditional materials with some modern techniques. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't have access to these traditional teachers. So part of it was just trial and error and sort of figuring out how to work with these traditional materials. The one thing that came from uh, this whole journey for me, which I really wasn't expecting, was the ability to really broaden my worldview um, and then also fill a few gaps that were missing from my cultural identity. Um, 
and we'll talk about this more in the panel discussion, but even working with the materials, learning how they work and um, building relationship with them was really imperative to all of the work that I've done since then. And aside from quill work, um, I'm a registered Indigenous health professional working in the social work field. So I deal a lot with mental health and addictions and um, all of the work that I do artistically really brings medicine to the work I do in terms of um, working with individuals as well. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, as I started to find a passion for quill work, I started to track my journey on social media and I never expected it, but I started to amass a following of almost 30,000 people across different platforms. And at that time, it was overwhelming. Um, I started to get a lot of requests from people asking for me to share knowledge, but I was so early in my journey and I didn't feel, um, I didn't feel safe providing this knowledge. This whole cultural understanding of my own identity is, is fresh for me too. There's the impacts of intergenerational trauma that have really stopped me from pursuing um, my indigeneity throughout my life. So it took a lot of sitting with teachers, sitting with myself before I felt comfortable going into um, being a sort of a knowledge keeper and sharing this. So over the last three years, um, my social media platforms have been expanding to the point where I had to establish sort of a business framework for this. And we'll go to the next slide. As I started to um, look into workshops, I needed to set up a structure for myself and it sort of fell upon building relationships reciprocity and revitalization. And when I say relationships, it's not just relationships with people, it's relationships with creation. And as mentioned, um, when I go out and I learned how to harvest materials, I needed to build a relationship with the birch bark, wigwas. I needed to know how it worked. Um, it took a lot of just opening up my spirit and sitting with uh, creation to understand how I can start to um, use my own worldview to understand how I can manipulate these uh, different traditional materials. So reciprocity, it's a really big piece to this. Quill work is expensive and this knowledge is not mine. I'm not a gatekeeper by any means. So it's very important that I, I share what I can when it's appropriate with the people who it's appropriate for. And the revitalization is the cornerstone of this. When I got into porcupine quill work, I had no clue of the history of this. It was all fresh learning for me. And when I started to look at my community <clears throat> and where the state of quill work was, um, it was it was sad. It was very sad for me. It's not that there wasn't people still practicing it, but there was a whole generation, two generations that just really lost the passion and interest not only due to the effects of colonization, but the intergenerational trauma that was present within our community. So it's been a little bit of a, a process to start to not only open up and share my own um, story and teachings, but then to share it with the community and see a lot of people just start to revitalize, not only in Rama, but outside and in the broader Indigenous communities. We'll go to the next slide, please. So again, um, the social medias have been a huge platform and that's outside of the norm for indigenous uh, culture and sharing. But we're trying to do it in a very safe way and build a community that's not only safe, but secure as well. So if you have an opportunity and you haven't checked out the different platforms, um, take a look at you know Facebook, Instagram and TikTok and my website as well. So miigwech. Thank you so much, Kyle. And now I'm going to introduce Camille Turner. Uh, Camille Turner is an artist and scholar born in Kingston, Jamaica, and currently based in Toronto. Her work combines Afrofuturism and historical research to explore race, space, home, and belonging. Her most recent explorations confront the entanglement of what is now Canada in the transatlantic trade in Africans and put into practice Afro. Afronautics, a methodological frame she developed to support colonial archives from the point of view of a liberated future. Camille is a graduate of Ontario College of Art and Design and has completed a PhD at York University's Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. 
Currently, she is a provost postdoctoral fellow at University of Toronto's Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. Camille's work has been presented throughout Canada and internationally and is collected by museums and private collectors. She is the recipient of the 2022 Artist Prize awarded to recognize outstanding contribution to the Toronto Biennale of Art. Camille, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Susan. And, and Jordan, thank you so much for your generosity. It's, it's wonderful to be here amongst um, these, these amazing artists to, to learn about everyone's practice. Um, could I hear, can I see the next slide, please? Great. So in my latest body of work, I draw on the foundational concept of the Black Atlantic, referencing modern hybrid cultures that emerged through the violent upheaval of 12 million Africans forced from their homelands and scattered across the ocean. The ship is a moving space of terror that connects locations across the Black Atlantic. And my work engages with this concept through the story of 19 slave ships that were built in 18th century Newfoundland. My journey, uh, next slide, please. My journey into this story began in 2014 when I visited Senegal. Um, I went there to think about the future and to explore the roots of Afrofuturism, which I draw on in my work. Next slide, please. I visited Saint Louis, a beautiful UNESCO World Heritage Site about five hours north of Dakar. In Wolof, um, this is known as Indar. Walking through the colonial buildings of Indar felt like walking through a dream. Next slide, please. I went on an architectural walking tour, and at the very first building, the guide told us that this house was the, was the first trading post in the area. It had been owned by a young French couple who traded in gum Arabic, palm oil, and captured Africans they trafficked as slaves. Next slide, please. He took us to a dark, dank cellar. And he told us that we were standing in the place where enslaved people had been imprisoned. I was overwhelmed by the unspeakable horror of what had transpired in this place. There's no way for me to know if my ancestors had been here in this cell, but their memory called out to me. I fell backward in time and I became a vessel for the story that emerged as I opened myself to the spectral residue of this violence. Next slide, please. A year later, I was invited to Newfoundland to participate in an exhibition entitled New Found Lands, curated by Pamela Edmonds and Bushra Janaid. The show explored historical entanglements of the Caribbean and Newfoundland. Bushra, who is a Newfoundlander of Nigerian and Caribbean heritage, has been researching this topic for decades, and she generously shared her research with me. This is a letter. Um, what you're seeing here is a letter that was um, uh, written to the, um, in 1790 to the Bristol merchant James Rogers, who was the owner of the Sarah, a slave ship built in Newfoundland. Um, when I saw this document, I was stunned. The existence of a vessel like this opened my eyes to the ways that, as Gilroy explains, the history of the transatlantic enslavement of Africans is everywhere. It saturates the modern world. Next slide, please. Um, so three years later, I was invited back to Newfoundland to participate in the 2019 Bonavista Biennial, and I decided to focus my attention on the slave ship Sarah. And my partner, who is a historian, encouraged me to look in the Slave Voyages database to see if there were any more ships like this. And to my surprise, I found 42 ships al uh, built along the eastern seaboard of what is now Canada. 19 of these ship of these 42 ships were built in Newfoundland. Next slide, please. So I found out that forests had once hugged the shores, um, but after just two generations of colonization, all the trees three miles from the water had been cut down. The Beotuk, one of the islands that um, indigenous nations had retreated into the interior forest to avoid the often deadly encounters with European colonizers, but the invaders also pressed into the forest. 
harvesting trees to build their wooden world. With the violent encroachment on their land, there was no safe place for the Beotok to retreat to. After the trees had been devoured, the land became scarred and barren, yet Newfoundland is mythologized as a natural, unaltered, innocent, white space. When I attuned myself to what and who was silenced, I encountered ghost towns, indigenous dispossession, and genocide, and barren shores that were once covered by great stands of pine. Next slide, please. Um, so a performance began to emerge. I wrapped my head with white fabric. I wore a white jumpsuit and, a, and fisherman's gloves with fingers cut off. I put silver boot liners on my feet. The effect was otherworldly, futuristic, and ghostly. The character arrived from the future, from a time she refers to as the age of awakening. She travels back to our time, which she refers to as the age of silence. I filmed the character on the shores of Bonavista carrying a rock as evidence of the people who had been imprisoned in the holds of ships. In the 18th century, ships were, dis were built as displacement vessels. They were built to carry a load. In the absence of the load, the ships had to be loaded down by whatever um, was heavy, what, which is referred to as ballast. And this often includes rocks and soil from local areas where the ships were built. So when they sailed to West Africa, ballast rocks from Newfoundland were dumped out onto the shore so that the people, their intended cargo, could be loaded into their holes. So my character walks along the water um, and she carries a ballast rock that she found in West Africa. Um, and it, it had been brought there on one of the slave ships that was built in Newfoundland. Next slide, please. She entered an old building constructed from large trees, like the ones that were used to build the ships. And she reverently lays down the rock on the floor as a witness to this history. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's about it for me. This, this is um, one of the pieces that I created for the, the Bonavista Biennial and just to lay out some of the, the ideas that I'm working with. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. That was really powerful. Maybe before I go on to the next panelist, it, does anybody have anything that they would like to respond to Camille's presentation? Awesome. So our next panelist, Alia, sorry, Dr. Alia Fortune Weston. Um, she will be presenting, uh, she has presented uh, to us a pre-recorded uh, video. She may or may not be with us as she is in Zimbabwe currently. So, you know, Wi-Fi internet sometimes has a mind of its own. So if you're here still with us, that's awesome. If not, we'll make sure you rejoin. Um, so, Elia is a Cape um, um, is a Cape Malia. Sorry, I am so mispronouncing it. Is a is a Cap Malia South African English designer, scholar, and educator, born and raised in Zimbabwe. Her work ex uh, examines the ways that business and creativity contribute to social change through sustainable and creative economics, decolonial business. Uh, and food mythologies, methodologies. In this panel, Alia talks about the history of the Cap Malay community in South Africa, a unique and little known diasporic community formed through Dutch colonization in the 17th century. Her practice, her design practice is a contemporary form of wearable art that is a love letter to her family history and culture and the influence of her mixed heritages. As an associate professor of creative and business enterprise at OCAD University, Alia teaches courses that support art and design students in developing socially beneficial and ethical um, business capabilities. She runs two jewelry businesses, Alia Weston Jewelry and the Fireflies Adler, which supports community projects in Zimbabwe. I apologize for mispronouncing uh, the names. But the floor is yours. 
Should I just say a quick hi? Hi, everybody. I am actually here. I don't know how good my internet is. Um, so uh, I will play the pre-recorded video and then uh, I'll be here for a discussion afterwards. But also um, thanks a lot to all the panelists. It's really great to be here with everybody. And it's been great hearing all of your, um, your stories and sharing so far. Hi, everyone. I'm Malia, and I'm so glad to be here with all of you to share my family histories and creative works. Before I start, I'd like to extend the land acknowledgement that Susan offered. I respectfully acknowledge that my presentation is taking place in Toronto on Indigenous territories where I live and create these works. My contribution to this panel is virtual because I am currently en route, or possibly already situated, in Harare, Zimbabwe, the land of my birth. The area where I live is Mashana land, home to the Mashana peoples. And I equally acknowledge the Khoisan as the first peoples of South Africa, the land where my mother's Cape Malay ancestors were brought by the Dutch from Indonesia. Finally, I wish to highlight the parallel impacts of colonization that have created harm and continue to do so across all of these places. As Susan kindly introduced me, I am a mixed heritage Cape Malay English designer and scholar born and raised in Zimbabwe. My creative work is a way to explore and express the complexity that I experience as a person with multiple identities, living in between worlds. And it's also a way to acknowledge the tensions and the beauty that are held within such spaces. In this vein, my presentation is an oral story, a sharing of histories and a family archives of sorts. It's entitled, Love Letters to My Heritage. I will begin by sharing the unique and little known history of the Cape Malays, an African diasporic community formed through Dutch colonization in the 17th century. Yasin Kader explains how the Dutch extracted resources from colonies across various regions, including Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Madagascar, and Southern Africa. In Indonesia, where my ancestors are from, people resisted the trade in spices. These inconvenient dissidents who were artisans, tradespeople, religious leaders, and royalty were displaced to the Cape of South Africa. As enslaved peoples and exiles, they created new lives in the Cape and an entirely new culture of Muslim mixed heritage people with Asian, African, and European ancestry was formed. My Cape Malay heritage comes through my maternal grandfather's family. I chose to share these family pictures to depict the influence of this part of my heritage on my artistic practice. They show the love and care for my grandparents, my siblings, and my parents, as well as the artistry embedded in my Cape Malay culture. My grandfather and my great-grandmother were diamond miners. My grandmother, a remarkable dressmaker. If you recall the dresses that my cousin and I wear on the previous slide, these are made by our grandmother. While well, my mother creates exceptional food. For me, artistry is present in the creation of food and special occasion clothing, both of which are connected to deep forms of relational care. I am fascinated by Malay special occasion wear, which I've always found has a decorative beauty. Handmade pieces that are imbued with meaningful relationships, care, and artistry. These wedding images were gifted to me by my aunts and cousin to share specifically for this presentation. An important aspect to note are the Malay bridal headdresses called the Madura. These are typically made from a piece of fabric which is meticulously folded and pinned into a crown-like headdress. The artistry in, making, in the making of food and clothing has deeply influenced the design of my creative works. They are a way for me to connect and learn more about this part of my history and my heritage. Even the process of creating this presentation gave me the opportunity to deepen relationships with family members and learn more about my histories and cultures. For instance, through the photo gifted on the left, I learned about the Malay custom where my great aunt, as a bride-to-be, went out to Unang and personally invite community members, especially the elders, to her wedding. As a mixed heritage person, my Cape Malay identity sits alongside my English and Zimbabwean identities in a complex way. My English ancestry is directly tied to colonial oppression of South Africa and Zimbabwe. In contrast to this, I was born in Zimbabwe because my mother grew up during the South African colonial apartheid, and it was illegal for my parents to marry due to the racial segregation laws. They chose to resist oppression and they married anyway. And I continually question how to navigate these tensions that are bound with oppression and privilege and blessings. For me, moving forward is about acknowledging these difficult histories and at the same time working actively to create new possibilities. Inspired by my parents' love story, I engage through a perspective of decolonial love 
which echoes bell hooks notion of love as care hope and transformation to do this is to recognize that my creative works are as much influenced by my Cape Malay heritage as my English heritage. These images are from my father's family archives in England. They depict my great grandparents' farm, my grandparents' wedding, and our caring relationship with our grandmother. I did not get to meet my grandfather because he died before I was born, but I am told that we would have connected over our shared love of growing flowers. Artistry, decorative clothing, a love of nature, and relational care are all inspirations from this part of my family life too. As a jeweler, my metal lace making technique is influenced by my fascination with intricate traditional English bobbin lace. I developed my abstract metal uh, lace making technique at art school and later went on to actually learn bobbin lace making in Scotland from Jean Leader, a maker of exquisite lace. This was a long held dream come true. These images depict my artistic inspirations from my English family, including my great grandmother's paintings, as well as my humble, very humble attempts at bobbin, making bobbin lace with cotton and metal threads. I gained a huge respect for bobbin lace because it is really very hard to make. The final piece of my inspiration is my love of nature, especially spending time outside amongst beautiful grasslands and forests in Zimbabwe and South Africa. I have a particular love for the unique and intricate details of flower petals and laying under the constellations in the night sky. I abstract these elements into organic metal forms and then piece them together to create larger organic forms, lace fabrics, you could say, which have movement and shape that defy the rigid properties of metal. The following are select pieces of my creative works. My work is a contemporary form of wearable art intended to be worn for celebrations. It is influenced and shaped by the multiple layers of my mixed heritage and ancestry. Each piece is a love letter to my heritage and a way for me to express love for myself as a person living between worlds, as well as the complex tensions that this encompasses. It is also a way of expressing the love and the resilience that are central to my family histories and the survival of my ancestors. Well, my work is a way to maintain cultural knowledge, not only by speaking of the influences from my heritage, but through the moments of relationality when sharing stories with my family. For instance, the process of virtually rummaging through photos in boxes with my parents and family members while creating this talk um, was a way to do this. But it is also a way for me as an educator of creative business to, for instance, share a process of designing from one's own place in the world, being reflexive about the intended and unintended consequences of our work, and also speaking out about harmful practices like cultural appropriation. Working in the contemporary creative economy, I want to acknowledge that in addition to family histories and inspirations, the final outcomes of my works are the result of deeply collaborative work. So these beautiful images, also artistic works in themselves, were created in collaboration with many talented artists, friends and family, including Michelle, Sindhu, Shireen, Gilad, Noreen, Julie and Leslie Ann. My almost final thoughts are to pose a question that I continuously work through. How can a practice like jewelry design, essentially a form of business laden with toxic histories, contribute meaningfully to the world in a way that goes beyond aesthetic beauty and engages practically with decolonial love? I have many thoughts on this, but I will share two, while noting that I'm grateful for ongoing com conversations with collaborative friends for words that bring light to practice. For instance, Suzanne Marcet questions whether exposure to critical issues is always enough and asks, what are the ways that structure could be woven into work that supports communities? Well, Nati Tremblay and I explore the ways that acts of relational reciprocity can create regenerative care in the world. The following is one example of projects that I'm collaborating on to reimagine how wider relationships of business could be different. As a mixed heritage person, coming from a lineage of displaced people with the privilege of movement, I question what it means to engage in reciprocity with the land of my birth, the place that I call home. These pictures show a tree planting project from 2021, which is in collaboration with a primary school close to where I live. If you see the picture on the left, there was originally a single tree in the school grounds. We organized a workshop for the children on environmental issues, which was run by the Tree Knowers and Grows, a community organization that grows trees as an act of generosity and creativity. We did some tree planting, and we planted a mix of indigenous trees and fruit trees. 
and this is Auntie Shuppy and I with a tree she donated from her personal nursery. Later that year, another community organization called My Trees, which is working on reforestation, donated several hundred more trees, mostly acacias, for land remediation, and these were planted around the school. Perhaps I will end by saying, Tramakasi, thank you in Malay for being here to share my family histories and love letters with me. I am grateful to be able to share my ideas on decolonial love and the intersections with my history and artistic practice. Ultimately, I truly believe that by looking backwards and forwards through notions like decolonial love, we can reconfigure the historically toxic values and practices on which business is practiced and strive to create more meaningful social change. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Elia. Wow, y'all are doing some really, really, really phenomenal, awesome stuff. And um, while I was preparing for this presentation, I had to research all of you guys. <laughs> Um, and I did find like there are some overarching themes with all of your works and one of them what I did find was like reviving you know visual culture and your histories through different mediums that you are using whether it's sculpture or jewelry or textile painting or you know going into the archives and just you know seeing what's already there and then countering it essentially. Um, so I suppose my first question to you all is, how do you access visual culture, oral culture from your communities? Now, this is a three part question. Um, how do you access visual culture, oral culture from your communities? How have you accessed them? And where did you access them? And how did you incorporate that cultural knowledge into your work? Um, <clears throat> I can start off there. So um, as mentioned in the intro, um, at the time where I started to explore porcupine quill work, there was very little information that I could access through my community. So a part of it was doing research. And I found myself um, finding these really old documents. And although these documents most likely were created by uh, someone non-Indigenous, there was some very important quotes that were in there. Um, one that I remember is talking about um, the birch tree and when do we harvest the birch tree. Mm -hmm. um, if I recall correctly, it talked about um, the birch tree is ready to gift its, its uh, bark when the leaves uh, fully unfold. And that only happens in a specific time. So it was through different clues like that that I was able to go and then cross check that with some um, elders in my community when it was safe to do so. So a lot of it is this oral tradition mixed with some of these really old pieces that we're just able to find around um, to sort of accumulate a knowledge that we can uh, reclaim some of this stuff. Um, culturally, I was really able to um, sit with some elders and that was the most important pieces. When we sat with those elders, we were able to um, really connect and share sort of their knowledge versus what I um, was able to find and find some um, continuity to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. I am, um, you know, I can never figure out the timeline of my generation, but I'm, but I'm old enough to communicate effectively with my elders, but also young enough to know that new dance movements being created on TikTok or Instagram stories. So, um, so what I mean by that is there, there's a constant dance between communicating effectively with the elders and learning from them. Uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, we, we are passing down these shared experiences, right? This shared culture, uh, these shared memories as well. So there is a, you know, very delicate dance between learning from the elders, but also at the same time thinking about passing down that information and or, or, or uh, connection to the new uh, and probably current generation that thinks about creating um, uh, visual work or even upkeeping the oral culture. Uh, when I use the phrase next generation and so on, I literally mean 
you know, the young kids that we all are seeing in front of us and growing in front of us, right? And to think about ways we can include them in the broader discussion and conversation to, to think effectively and help them understand efficiently. Uh, because the thing about the art is, about the culture is that it's, it's not something that can be uh, naturally summed up, right? It has to be retained and maintained and made sure that uh, that gets passed on to 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 the next uh, uh, community or generation, I should say. Uh, yeah, um, for myself, uh, I'm I've been able to access a lot of these uh, community belongings through um, being part of the community, uh, being created in our communities, but also through. Porcupine Quill work in my community and other Mi'kmaq communities um, is being, it's in this beautiful revival uh, by a new generation. And it hasn't gone away. I think it's at some points throughout history, it was sleeping a little bit, but it's never disappeared. And the living oral traditions and, and knowledge is still alive and thriving right now. You're seeing a lot of young artists in all of our communities, but I can only speak for my own, but um, bringing, bringing these art forms back in a beautiful way. Um, and uh, I was speaking to some friends earlier, uh, walking through the uh, exhibition. Um, I have um, a really, uh, I have a great connection and a friendship with a curator at home, um, who is Mi'kmaq, his name is Roger Lewis, and he works at the Nova Scotia Museum. And he is responsible for taking care of our community belongings that are being held in the museum. And he's doing it in a beautiful way because anytime anybody from the Mi'kmaq community wants to see these porcupine quill works or any of our community belongings, he brings them in and lets them visit with them. And we get to hold them, we get to spend time with them. And um, it's um, been the source, I think, his work has been the source of a lot of people at home um, revisiting or seeing their great great grandmother's works um, so for me it's um, Roger has been instrumental in this um, other art forms that I've learned has been through family um, and, 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 and community other community members like I learned split ash basket weaving um, um, by my friend and close um, my, my relative Ursula Johnson and her, her grandmother and her auntie and other community members and uh, it's been, for me, it's been a road of discovery, just sitting and visiting. And I always talk about visiting within my pieces because a lot of these stories that were being told um, were being told over the making of art on at kitchen tables in community and being built. And I feel like those are the moments for me still where I get to learn the most about my community, who I am, the materials, um, and how all those things are connected. Um, yeah, and I guess I incorporated it um, by building on it and telling my own story because it's the only story I can really tell is my own story of who I am, where I come from. I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell my story through our, our lexicon, our beautiful, vibrant, and living and thriving um, colorways and, and our art forms and, and motifs. Um, yeah. For, for me, um, my journey um, has been one of trying to bridge a divide, trying to bridge this rupture um, and that, that um, basically took place at the door of no return, a, a rupture that interrupted um, um, our culture, our just even me knowing where I came from, um, what, what, you know, who are my ancestors? What languages did they speak? Those things are, you know, I can't know. Um, there's no archival record that I can go to to find, find this out. So I have to go within. And um, for me, it's been about um, dreaming. And it's been really um, amazing just being in that state of being receptive to what comes through, what and who comes through. 
and 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 what I gain from from um, just this this um, ancestral knowledge that that lives inside, you know. Um, so so that that is that is really one source. But um, also, I've been really um, blessed to to have incredible collaborators, people who I learn from. And um, the the last one of the last pieces I did was was called Nave, and um, it was such an interesting journey to make this piece because um, when I went to to shoot this this nave, which you know this nave of a church, I, I went to the nave and found out that it was stone, <laughs> not wood, and the the whole um, premise of this piece is about the the shipbuilders in in Newfoundland and and Jordan you 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 um you know you and I had conversations about this you know these shipbuilders were builders of some of the the um the the town structures including the churches so and and you you told me that you know looking up into the the um the naves of the church is like looking down into the hold of the ship so for me that was just like bing and I wanted to shoot, you know, the inside of a church. And it was COVID. I couldn't go to 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 Newfoundland, and I I couldn't shoot the church there. So I had to find one in Toronto. But when I went there, I found out it was a stone church. It's like, oh God, okay, I can't shoot. So I went back home, and this um, I I don't even know how this came to me, but it's just serendipity. It, it just just acts like that. Um, I, I, um, I found out about a god or a, a loa, a Haitian loa called Agwe. Mm -hmm. And Agwe is this loa of the sea. And when people were thrown overboard or jumped, jumped overboard of slave ships, and there are 2 million people on the, the floor of the ocean, he, he was the loa who would take these the, these um, these people back to his underwater lair, and so this was a really important clue. To just just um, learning about this, and then my um, cinematographer happened to be Haitian, so we had these conversations about this this loa. And then the, a friend of mine who's also Haitian, Emily Jabouin, just happened to be learning a song at the time that completely connected to what I was learning about this loa. And, and so she became a part of this piece. This would never have happened had I had, you know, this, this um, had I not, had we not um, been interrupted. If I had gone ahead and just, you know, executed my plan, shot this church, but it, you know, none of this would have happened. So I, I leave it to serendipity to, um, uh, to dreams, to, 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 to what intervenes and just being open to listening, to walking on the land, to, to listening to the water, to, to, to being aware of the knowledge that's, you know, in the stones. So, so this, this I feel is um, part of how um, I'm creating. I love it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Carry, no, carry on. Go, go. I was just going to work off of that and say, I love what you're saying just about connecting with spirit and being able to just intuitively understand and listen to creation. Um, if you listen, it's there and it will share that with you. Um, one of the, the stories that I like to share is around this um, unfinished quill box. And this was gifted to me by an elder in my community. And um, it sort of speaks to this, this point of listening to the spirits, listening to yourself. Um, the first person that I was able to connect to in my community that had any connection to quill work was um, an elder named Lorraine McCray. And her mother was a very talented quill worker and her name was Florence Schilling. So in the middle of the pandemic, um, you know, not even three months into my journey, I go knocking on her door and um, I have a little bit of a rapport with her. She's the one who gifted me my spirit name, which I do my work under, Manabindam. And um, 
we started talking and she showed me her entire quill box collection. And she went into detail about every single one that her mother um, created. So anyways, at the end of um, our visit, she let me take one home and it was, it was so beautiful. It reminded me of um, stories about my grandmother. And um, as, I, as I chose this one, I don't know why, but when I got it home, I started looking at it closer. So take a quick look at this. Again, I'm only a month or two, maybe three months into learning quill work. And what I started hearing from this is, this is how you make a quill box. This is how it's constructed. This is how we put together the different pieces. And at that time, I hadn't even attempted to create a quill box. I hadn't even finished my first piece. I went on to um, practice more quill works and started developing different medallions. But um, when the time came, I studied this very closely because the construction can be very complicated. How do we take these circles and um, create a structure that we can quill on? Um, eventually, I wanna say that Florence was speaking to me through this quill box and I was able to replicate something along the lines and start developing my own quill work. Mm -hmm. So it's really beautiful and that same process can happen when you just listen to spirit. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro, going out into the bush, um, learning how to actually harvest the birch bark and developing relationships. It's that same, that same process. If you listen close enough, it'll teach you what you need to know. Thanks for adding that, Kyle. Um, yeah, I it, it's reson resonating with me around thinking through being somewhere and do and doing and just being um, being with. Um, so the one thing I wanted to add because I did briefly talk about how the relationships with aunts with my parents. You know, I, I live very far away, so we do a lot of this over digital uh, technology and the you know, creating this presentation, everyone was looking through photos and we were having all of these conversations. And so that was a big moment of kind of learning and being able to um, meet with them and um, kind of share space together and just, um, you know, have these like stories come up and words, like lost words. I, I don't really hear people to, uh, say uh, uh, words in Malay as much as they uh, did when I was little uh, and then just sharing kind of all these historical things. Um, but uh, actually during the pandemic, um, because I started to do this more and more, um, because of a during the pandemic, I ended up being with my parents for a really uh, long period of time. I was in Zimbabwe for seven months. It was unexpected. Uh, and so my mom and I would cook together every day. Um, and I would say, teach me how to make this, um, the persisters, and teach me how to make this dish, and teach me how to make this dish. And I would take pictures of, of her hands, and I would watch the food, and I would ask her questions. Um, and it was sort of that kind of process that got me thinking about how being with the, the kind of the doing and the creation of these family foods uh, and the history in that um, and how that kind of led to a process of me reflecting more on oral histories um, and thinking through history and story and what could tell us about the past and the future. Um, and, and, and another reason why, because like originally, I never used to talk very publicly about my family history or about, you know, the impact of colonization and the shaping of that, um, and even my, my parents' history, which I, I asked um, if I could share this um, uh, like in public. And it was because I actually, I read a book um, that was the only book I've ever read, which resonated with me about somebody in my culture, which actually was a person with my name, um, but it was about a young girl who is in South Africa, the racial designation of somebody who's mixed race is colored, a young colored uh, woman who's Muslim grappling with her complex identity and she doesn't know who she is. And, you know, I never in my life come across a book that um, said something about anything to do with my life history and thought, wow, like, you know, what world am I in that I don't see myself reflected in art and I don't see myself reflected in books. Um, and even our culture is about like, 200 or 300,000 people and it's so unique that nobody even has heard of it. I've, and I only ever in my life had one person go, oh my God, Kate Malay, I know what that is. I've heard about it before. Um, so it's these kinds of experiences um, and the relationality and those moments where kind of something emerges uh, that I it started to think, okay, I wanna talk more actively about this. 
I want to share stories. Um, I want to like carry on this like relationality of communication so that I can uh, bring it forward and share it and, and pass on something about where I'm from and who I am, not only for myself, but to share it with, with people in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. I also wanted to add on. Now I'm not an artist. I am an artist worker, so I work with artists. Um, but I do have my own experience um, in terms of like uh, looking through uh, the Somali history in totality. Um, one of the things that is still really fresh in my mind to this day is that so I studied history at um, here in Canada and. I remember from one of my courses, I was literally told like, you know, oral history is not really recognized as a valid form of history, um, which was kind of like conflicted to who I am. I am Somali, um, specifically from Somaliland and oral culture, oral history, it is like a large part of our, of who we are. And that's as, as people from, from the Somali Peninsula. Um, so I was like, okay, um, I will go to my home country, which I have done uh, a couple of times um, where I have um, sat with the elders in our community with my grandmother. And she's always happy to share the sayings in Somali's called Mamai um, about, you know, different sayings and whatnot. So for me, it's always like trying to you know, learn more about my own history, who I am as a person and where I have come from, where my parents have come from, where my grandparents were um, in their entire lives, uh, which is within the Somali and Venezuela. So I really would like to thank you all for like, you know, uh, sharing your experiences um, and truly do appreciate hearing your responses as well. Um, I do have another question. Um, my second question is, um, in your communities, how do you manage any gaps in the visual art or oral culture of your community, such as knowledge or you know, materials available, skill training or language barriers? If you were to go, for instance, in an elder in your community and you weren't able to speak the language, how are you able to overcome that sort of barrier, for instance? I'm sort of struggling to, to find an answer for that. Um, I think anytime a barrier comes, it's it never really ends up being a barrier. You find a way around it, whether it's you seek out um, other resources or seek out someone um, that can um, help you get where you need to go. And again, that intuitive process of knowing yourself, um, you know, relying on spirit is I think really what drives a lot of artists and, and us to really accomplish what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to agree with that and, and also um, not trying to, you know, be afraid to try new things in order to continue the conversation in the culture and the tradition. Um, you, know, you run into places where, um, you know, like you were saying earlier, um, not knowing about the certain uh, history about your culture, but you you negotiate this by conversating with the elders, by you know listening from them, by learning from them, and then also applying that in a new way in which you can express that. Um, for for example, storytelling is an old form of practice, which you have witnessed when you went back to Somalia, uh, mm -hmm. which is what we use all the time to convey and share wisdom and and, and memories as well. So it's, you know, for the Somali community, um, you know, wherever we find ourselves nowadays is that, you know, there is a lack of an archival center from which we can really learn our history. And if we do even try to go back as far as we can, and then you have the issue of coloniality in the mixture and imperialism and so on, that you have to constantly be, you know, um, being on, on the, on the edge of, of carefully looking at what is truly the, his, the history of Somalia of versus what has been told to us. And that I think it's, 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 a, um, it's a gap that we are constantly trying to fill in uh, as we move forward, but we cannot um, 
um, stop thinking, stop reflecting, stop practicing, um, because otherwise um, the conversation then will stop. Because all we're trying to do is make sure that we continue the conversation our elders have had. I think for me, it's, uh, yeah, this continual journey for continuing our, and changing our stories, adding to it. You know, like uh, I often talk about these pieces that I like, the core pieces, you know, they're, they're living and they, they have history and they have voice. Uh, and there's makers that still make, I'm very thankful for that in my community. You know, like um, there's, um, some folks um, from PEI that um, Cheryl Simon, um, amazing co-worker, Melissa, Peter, Paul, and Kay Sark, and they're known as the Quill Sisters. And they, um, they started this podcast, um, a beautiful history of porcupine quill work in Mi'kmaq territory. So it's finding new ways to communicate these um, histories and, you know, creating new resources um, so the gaps mm -hmm. that once felt like gaps are not gaps anymore. You know, there were just void spaces that needed to be revisited. And um, we're filling it in in new ways. So like myself, I, I've done some co work. I'm nowhere near as good as Melissa, who did this piece. But I learned from my... Um, sisters and brothers who do it. Um, but I, I'm interpreting it through my own means uh, and working with our designs through painting and sculpture and different things, um, because I feel like it's a living and evolving uh, lexicon, a living and evolving um, art form and language. And the wild thing about basket making in our territory and stuff like that is uh, there's certain words that uh, would not exist if the technique did not exist. So I've been told that there's like a certain way that you move your fingers or, or a certain way that you weave the split ash basket. That word is only used for that. So if you lose the technique, you lose the word too. So it's the, it's the continual, continual passing down of this information. And I'm not a language speaker. I didn't grow up with the language. I'm learning some words. I'm learning some ways to communicate um, um, with our language. And the more I learn about Mi'kmaq language, the more it clicks with me um, in terms of um, worldview, because there's it's just inexplainable in English or colonial language. There's such a depth to connection to territory and, and everything around. So I feel like as a, the new generation, um, of artists and the, the generation is going to come after all of us again. Uh, the gaps are just going to hopefully tighten up. Yeah, yeah. For me, um, how I deal with the gaps and the silences is to to actually listen to the silence and to realize that silence actually um, it's. It's not a, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's kind of an opening. It's like, it's like what you're saying, Jordan, you know, the silence um, offers direction and it, it actually um, offers information. You just have to, to sit with it and listen. And, um, and I feel like the, this, this last body of work that I'm, that I'm work that I'm working on you know about the ships that were the slave ships that were built in Newfoundland. I I feel like um, it's such an unimaginable story that I can't come at it straight. I have to I have to come at it um, with some um, Anansi tactics. Anansi was was a, a trickster, a storyteller who crossed um, the ocean in the Middle Passage, and you know, and, and Nancy never came at anything straight, always um, uh, ginnelled his way. Ginnelling is, you know, that's what a trickster does. <laughs> always came at it from another angle that you don't see coming. 
And so I feel like um, those kind of tactics are are necessary in in stories like this, in stories where there is there is silence. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's more about trying to find out and learn because there, there is no such thing as a whole Cape Malay language. It doesn't exist. There are words which have been passed down for certain things. Like I spoke about some of the words like tomakasi is thank you and uanang is the word for the bride-to-be to go out and to ask the elders, invite them to her wedding. And um, I, I remember hearing words like this when I was little. And as I got older, I started to hear other words in other languages that were spoken for these kinds of things. And I started to think, well, why am I not hearing these anymore? Um, so it was a process of actively wanting to reach out and find out and remember words. Um, so I'd reach out to aunts and speak to my mom um, and various people and have these conversations um, to try to remember and to actively put them back into my, my vocabulary and intentionally use them. Um, so that has been my process of um, kind of actively filling in, filling in gaps and wanting to reclaim something that I feel has been lost, I think, over time in general, because of, I mean, the, when the Dutch brought um, in the Nigerian and Malaysian and, uh, slaves and people from that region down to South Africa, that, that, that rich culture was brought there, but it has become its own culture, like entirely different culture now. Um, but then through the centuries, words have changed and language has changed um, and things have been lost. And now even I think in contemporary times, people are using them even less and less. Um, so it's about, for me, it's about reclaiming and, and actively putting them into spaces where it might be just a few words, but those words are like better than not having them in the everyday use of uh, like when I'm talking. Thank you. Um, so we have two questions from the audience. I'm not sure if we would be able to answer both. I'll start off with the first question. Um, how does this, these suppressed histories include also a Black Indigenous with disabilities here and or moving forward? Can you repeat the question? Sure. How does these suppressed histories include also Black Indigenous with disabilities here and or moving forward? Um, I think it focuses on um, revitalizing it regardless of, um, regardless of our positions as uh, oppressed people. Um, that's what we used to do as a collective, right? We were never this individualistic society. Um, we were a collective and everybody had a role. Everybody had um, love to give one another. And when, when there was um, issues, when people were struggling, when people weren't retaining information or passing it along, um, there was support, support from the community, support from the, the elders. Um, that's why, you know, we were such a knowledgeable um, people across the world, like indigenous peoples. We were scientists. We were such um, important individuals to creation. So maybe I didn't answer the question. Maybe I'm having a hard time understanding, but I think it really boils down to the fact that um, as a people, we are grasping more to the old ways of being a collective rather than individual or individuals, which I feel is really going to help us all pull towards, um, you know, the future and, and reclaiming a lot of this. I agree. Um, and then the second question is, how does this produced work around art theft stay secure message out there and the archives lively without being appropriated. So the question is, how does this produced work around art theft stay secure message out there and the archives lively without being appropriated? I'm trying to understand what the question is, but I'm getting something yeah. around maybe issues of cultural appropriation, keeping work safe, 
what do we do about that? And that's something that you sort of related to Kyle earlier when you were speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I remember you saying something about creating uh, communities where you learn about um, cool work uh, to protect it. Um, mm -hmm. If that's something you expressed. Uh, and I think a lot about this because, um, you know, I went to art, an art school where the name of the art school was somebody who was involved in the slave trade. And, um, and then I was taught to appropriate as a way of designing. And that's the tradition of how people learn to design um, in our society. And it's awful. Um, and I I actually never did that because I, I always tried to uh, intentionally design from my own experience, uh, but it really made me question later on when I started really critically thinking about it and thinking, what, what are we actually doing in, in our educational systems? How are we educating people? Um, and, and what are the values and ethics that are involved in that? And that's why I talk so publicly about, you know, what are the problems in business or even like jewelry is a, is a design business um, and how are we uh, carrying on these toxic histories and, and, and practices uh, when we're not addressing things like uh, cultural appropriation. So um, I think for me as an educator, it starts out around, you know, speaking about that um, and having conversations about what cultural appropriation actually is, how it cause, uh, continues to cause harm, how it um, as disrespectful, um, you know, takes away economic benefits from communities, from oppressed communities historically, um, and actually actively creating these conversations so people can learn and we can think about how to move forward, how to be respectful, how to change the relationships that we create work, um, like what those relationships are, uh, and actively do that in a respectful way. So for, for me, that's where I'm coming from as an educator. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And I often talk about appropriation versus appreciation um, within my workshops because it's it's something that's uh, it can be very difficult to to navigate that as indigenous people sharing this knowledge widely as well. People see it, they feel they can replicate it because they have the tangible skills or the materials are widely available. And that brings up some really good conversations about what is appropriation and what is appreciation and what's okay and not okay for someone to do. And sometimes they're difficult conversations where people's feelings get hurt. But at the, at the core of it is this is who we are. This isn't uh, something that um, you know, we take really lightly. So respect, um, love, just all of these really important teachings need to come at play when people are exploring different cultural mediums. That was well said. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Leah. Um, thank you all for joining us today, honestly. Um, this discussion, uh, this panel discussion, it really touched based on like reviving lost histories through our own ways, our own practices. Um, and, and I have learned a lot from each and one of one of you, like truly and honestly. So I really do appreciate you all coming today, taking your time, um, you know, being able to share your knowledge with everyone who is joining us today or who would be watching the video later on. Um, so thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, much. Thank you guys. So much, Nancy. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Have a fantastic fantastic Wednesday. It is Wednesday, depending on where you are. <laughs> um, stay safe and stay warm. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Recording stopped.